Today is October the 4th, 2019. My name is Tanya Fincham and along with me is Ben Pollard. We are in South Coffeeville, Oklahoma to speak with uh, Scotty Harriman. And this is part of our Oklahoma's Conservation Heritage Oral History Project, which is sponsored by the Oklahoma State University Library and the Oklahoma Conservation Historical Society and the Natural Resources Conservation Service. And let's start with, uh, Scotty is Harriman Farms. Yes. And, and a member of the Oklahoma Conservation Commission 2013 through 2023. I think so. Roughly. On my second term, so. Your second term, okay. Yeah. So thank you for letting us come today. Well, you're quite welcome. Uh, let's begin with learning when and where you were born. I was born in Caulfield, Kansas, which is just uh, uh, two miles to the Kansas border, and Caulfield's the first uh, town, obviously. And uh, I was born in 1949, and uh, uh, we uh, actually lived uh, east of Caulfield. My folks had, had moved up here from Canadian County, uh, El Reno, Calumet area, and uh, moved up here in 47, and I was born in 49. What brought them here? Well, that's a good question. I've asked them over time. Uh, they farmed down there. My grandparents were both from down there. Uh, uh, and in the mid to early 40s, uh, some folks started migrating from Canadian County to Montgomery County and Labette County, uh, Kansas, which is just across the border. And as time went on, more families were coming. Uh, it was almost like a migration of, of an area down there. And I asked Dad, why did y'all move up here uh, in Southeast Kansas? And he just simply said it rained more and it looked like it promised you more uh, crops. Well, as time went on, uh, Dad would also say, you know, it promises so much and gives you so little <laughs> because of the weather. But uh, that's why they came up here. Uh, Back in the early 50s, I can remember going to the Canadian County Picnic uh, in Kansas, where they would all gather, and uh, there was probably 15, 16, 18 families that came from that area and migrated to this area. Uh, so they would have their annual picnic, which was which was really neat. Uh, but uh, that's that's a story. Uh, we lived. Uh, in Kansas on the farm there, East Coffville, and uh, then moved to the west part of Coffville as I was a child. And finally, Dad come back to his senses and come back to Oklahoma. <laughs> and it wasn't far in Oklahoma, uh, South Coffville, but truly was Oklahoma. And uh, so that's where my roots uh, came from, was actually Canadian County. And, and, and ended up up here. So I'm, a, I'm one that guards the Kansas border from the Jayhawkers coming down <laughs> and the K-Staters. Uh, being an Oklahoma State fan that I am, uh, uh, got lots of friends, of course, in, in Kansas that, that are both K-State and KU, but uh, I would have to tend to lean toward the K-Staters. <laughs> <laughs> and did you have brothers and sisters? I do and did. Uh, I've got two sisters that are a little older than I, and then I had one brother that was uh, 15 months younger than I, Larry, and uh, uh, in 1968 he was uh, killed in an auto accident just half a mile. Mm -hmm. So uh, that left me the only boy uh, at home to farm with dad. So. And, and what did your dad farm? We farmed uh, a typical uh, wheat, uh, some corn, very little, uh, soybeans uh, as they were becoming more popular back then, and oats and alfalfa, and of course had cows and had some hogs, and the typical farm that we, we ran. And what was your typical chore? <laughs> Well, I, I guess I could go back even uh, when my grandfather died, which lived just a half a mile north of where we are right now. Uh, 
when he passed away in about 62 or 3, uh, they were milking cows uh, three or four. And uh, my brother Larry and I, uh, each night, each every other night, would, would go stay with Grandma and get up before we went to school and, and milk those three or four cows mm -hmm. and uh, then go to school. And then when you come home, well, then it'd be the other one's turn to milk in the evening and stay all night and milk the next one. So we did that for several years. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't have milk cows at home, but we did at grandma's and they were about a mile from my folks. Hand milking? Hand milking, naturally. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't anything modern. <laughs> uh, but it was, a, it was a job we had to do as children. I was probably uh, 10, 11 years old, I guess, 12. So uh, something you had to do and you did it and you didn't know any difference. So you got the job done. And it was good training looking back, you know. Uh, well, do you remember the first time you drove a tractor? I don't know about the first time, but uh, I know when I was 10, uh, I was taking a big uh, Minneapolis Moline, uh, what's called a Wheatland model. You'd stand on the platform with very big round fenders, and I was just big enough to seal with the fenders and was literally uh, farming with it. And then in the next year or two, I found myself driving 10 miles south down the road to a farm down Malinapal, uh, farming down there all day. And somehow, I guess the folks would come and get me that evening. But uh, to think back, you know, would I turn my 11 year old grandson on that now? Absolutely not. But we all did it then and didn't think anything about it. Uh, there was no uh, safety anything about safety on that rig, but, but that's just where we grew up. So uh, that's probably my first memories of tractors. Okay. Did, do you remember if you wore a hat for some protection? No, we didn't. Uh, as a matter of fact, all you did then was, was a t-shirt and might have a little ball cap and sit out in that sun all day long and, and, and carry your water in a gunny sack wrapped a jar uh, it was crude, uh, by all means, and the sun was harsh on me, as, as, as you can see now. I'm, I'm paying for those things now, I'm going to the uh, skin doctor uh, quite often. But, uh, yeah, uh, again, there was no safety, uh, anything about that, <laughs> and noise levels. You know, we rode those things uh, day and night. And uh, it seemed like the louder they were, the more power they're going to have. So let's let it roll. And fortunately, I can still hear. And I don't wear hearing aids yet. So uh, it's just some of those things you do as, as kids. Looking back, yes, you'd like to wear ear protection, eye protection, a large hat, uh, sun, you know, sunscreen, all the above. But those things weren't even known of mm -hmm. then. So. Issues. Yeah. Well, let's back up. What was your grandparents' names that you would go have milk? Uh, W.J. Herman, William Joseph Herman, and Grandma was with Sarah, and I dearly loved my grandma. Uh, you know, she started us drinking coffee when we was 11 years old every morning. She'd build that breakfast for us before we'd go out and, and uh, milk, and uh, you boys got to have some coffee now to get this day going. So we manned up and drank coffee uh, way back then. <laughs> and uh, she just treated us like we were, uh, you know, young men. And, but we were yet just little guys. So I've uh, got very fond memories uh, of Grandma Well, what kind of food would she fix that you liked the best? Well, she had cast iron, uh, waffle iron. It was a, looked like a pan turned upside down with a lid on it. And she would put that over the stove to heat that container up and then pour the waffles and they were just wonderful. And of course, biscuits and gravy, uh, sausage or, or ham or bacon. I mean, it was a full blown glass of milk and drink your coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's, it's quite a deal. Did her house have indoor plumbing? It did. Uh, grandparents did here. Uh, 
So it, it, it was okay. Yeah, we went to uh, several places in Oklahoma to see her family and his family. Back then, they were still living, her brother and sister, and some of those did not have, and also had wells that uh, you literally went outside and dropped the rope and then pulled it up. There's a long, slender tube, and you could pinch it and drop it into. So I can remember that. I, I'm not that old, but yet it was old times then, in the early 50s. So, yeah, I got to uh, witness some of that. And real electric coming in some places. Yes, some of them just barely had electric you know, then. So, but we it seemed like we always did here, here. Well, with doing chores and that sort of thing, what would you do for fun? Oh, my brother and I, uh, of course, he was just 15 months younger, so we were about the same size. Uh, sports, uh, climbing trees, typical boy stuff, uh, trying to ride cows, uh, the hogs we would jump and see if could stay on the longest, just, you know, free with them. And things like this that any typical kids would do. Uh, yeah, grandma had pear trees, apple trees, and, you know, stupid things like see how far you can throw the, the pear over the barn and stuff like that. You know, just things that kids typically get into, but as compared to today, it wasn't too bad. Go fishing? Yeah, we did. We go fishing. Uh, the farm I talked about uh, driving that tractor down to Atlanta Paul, which is 10 miles south, uh, Grandma did not have a driver's license. So I guess the tractor was in place when Grandpa farmed when we were boys. Uh, and, and Grandpa and Grandma would take uh, the two of us boys uh, in the pickup, of course, we rode in the back, <laughs> and land there at that place and would stay all day. And Grandpa would farm, and Grandma would pack a, a big lunch. And, and again, we'd have water in a, in a tin jug with honey sacks wrapped around it. And so she had to entertain us, so to speak, all day, and we would fish in the ponds. Uh, I remember a hillside that, that was farmed back then that uh, we would find round rocks, I guess over time would actually wash down from something. And so if Grandpa tilled that ground, we could go search for these round rocks. And that was, that was an entertaining thing. But uh, certainly there was no videos, no radios, no nothing, no clocks. You didn't know exactly what time it was, but it made for a long day, but we didn't know any difference. Mm -hmm. so, and Grandma was there, so it didn't matter. Yeah. Do you look for arrowheads? Would they have been we did not. There was no arrowheads down there. Uh, no, I've never, I've never uh, had that opportunity. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about school. Where did you go to elementary school? I started out uh, west of Caulfield, you know, a little little school uh, there, and then when I moved into Oklahoma, I went to South Caulfieldville uh, Elementary. Uh, when I was in the eighth grade, it was the last year for the rural schools out away from here to exist because then they, when we were in the ninth grade, we went to Lenapal High School and all these little schools were closed down. So all those kids came in with us and it was quite a meshing of rural kids uh, coming together and it, it was very good, but went to Lenapal, uh, graduated in 1967, and uh, thought I wanted to go to college. I really wasn't ready to go to college, but it was time. So I went to junior college at, at Coffeyville. After a year, I think it was a year up there, I wanted to transfer to OSU and did, and was going to major in ag education to be a boy teacher. I didn't really know if I wanted to do that, but it, it was kind of an insurance backup. It, I didn't want to farm, I could teach. But that was cut short uh, in 69. Uh, the, the, the Vietnam War was, was really escalated and they were, they were wanting to draft any and everybody uh, that they could. Well, in 69 was the first year of the, of the lottery. The lottery was a draft card numbering system 
and I believe it attached to your, uh, maybe your birthday, but my number out of 365 was something like 351 or so. I mean, like we used to say, they would take pregnant women before they took us. But the first year was only countywide, countywide. We live in Noata County. It's one of the smaller counties east of I-35 with 10,000 people. And our draft lady told us, we will go through that full 365 and start over and you will be drafted. Well, it kind of scared us. We were in school, but yet I will get you, you know, that's what she said. So we, uh, we, as in my friends around here, uh, there were 13 of us from down this area that joined a armor reserve unit in 1969 in Independence, Kansas, which is uh, uh, 20 miles, 22 miles from here. And they had just got back from Vietnam, emptied out to inactive reserve, and they needed like 140 guys to fill that unit back up. And we joined and uh, spent six years in the military uh, reserves, got <laughs> Basically got done with that, and by then it was, it was uh, school was not on my mind. It was farming, and my dad's health was uh, deteriorating somewhat, and uh, we uh, farmed together. And certainly I wasn't holding up my side, but uh, started farming. The rest is history. I never went back to school after that, and uh, been farming ever since. So, yeah. So you you might have finished one year at LSU. Yes. 1968, yeah, that, you know, 16, Yeah. So it was short lived, but you know, I wish I could have gone on ahead and completed. But looking back, I probably would have done the same thing because the lady says, "I'm going to get you," <laughs> and she would have, she would have got us all. Well, the next year, I need to finish that story. The next year uh, of the lottery went nationwide. And I think they got up to about 90, uh, the number 90. And there's no way that I would have been drafted, see. So, uh, but those things in life occur and you deal with them accordingly. And uh, so that's why we joined and, and got, got into that area. Did the other 11 or 12 stay in it as long as you did? Yes. Or if you all 13 together started? Pretty well. We, we we stayed in that unit, yeah, you know, for six years. You committed for six years, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a, a, an Army Reserve unit or a National Guard unit uh, was in existence then. But also, the draft was obviously uh, went right on. So they were drafting in and everybody they could. Uh, our unit did not have to go back to Vietnam. Uh, we escaped that, I guess you would say. Uh, so we stayed in the States and uh, it was a good experience, uh, but I'm glad it's over. Yeah. And that would bring us up to 1975-ish? Yeah, we got married uh, in 74, married, married to my wife Jo. Uh, she was a girl that went to uh, Delaware High School, which was just down the road from Winnipeg. Uh, we were uh, uh, furious opponents in sports, but uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, she had gone to junior college and was working at the junior college, actually, when she got out, and I met her, and, and we were married in uh, June of 74, so, yep. How did you pop the question? I always have to ask that. How did you pop the question? <laughs> well, I frankly don't know. It, it was just kind of blurred my mind. All I knew was... Maybe my hormones were working. I don't know, but all I need to do is marry this girl because that's who I love. So uh, we we came back uh, to the farm, and uh, she was not a farm girl, but she learned it real well, and then uh, continued to farm through the '70s, uh, and then we entered into the '80s, and that's another story. But before we get there, let's go back and talk. Did, did your dad or your grandparents practice any conservation? 
Yeah, my grandfather didn't. Obviously, that would have been uh, uh, pre-conservation uh, information in the eastern side of Oklahoma. I know in the west there were things going on they had to deal with. Uh, of course, the Dust Bowl, that's it's a given. But in our country over here, it was more from water erosion because we get so much rain, uh, typically 40 inches. So grandfather, I cannot remember. I mean, yes, he had terraces. I do know that. He farmed around the terraces. Uh, but then my dad uh, was fairly active in, in that area because he knew different grounds that we even rented had to have some terraces and waterways to control uh, the erosion we were experiencing. And so we worked with, he worked with uh, uh, ASCS back then and the SCS, Soil Conservation Service back then. And they got some of these established uh, on some of those lands that we even rented. They, I keep saying we, I was a boy, but uh, he established. Then as my dad and I uh, farmed together after I got out of high school, uh, we started doing a little more of the, uh, the uh, erosion control more than anything. So that was the earliest conservation, I guess, in my family that I can remember. Was he involved with the conservation district at any, at any No, point? not as a district member or, or anything like that. He was, uh, he was just farming. Yeah. My dad's a little different than I am in that way because he was one of those guys that would rather not be up front and have to talk and, and you know, get in a board meeting. He, he just never had to do that, never did. I think he did in, uh, in high school. Uh, we've got a picture uh, in here that it, it's, a, it's about four foot wide that scrolls out. It's a panoramic view of what he was in the National 4-H Congress in Chicago back in the 30s or so. So I know he had that experience he was evidently selected from Canadian County or Oklahoma one. But over the years, he got to where he didn't participate in that. <laughs> well, were you in 4-H or FFA? I was in 4-H early and then, of course, FFA through high school and showed hogs. And, and uh, yeah, I learned all about the 4-H effort or the FFA effort. And that's what even made me want to maybe teach FFA, but uh, I took a different path in my life and didn't, but uh, yeah, I learned a lot. Well, in high school, did you have a, a vocational ed teacher that, or ag teacher? We had an ag teacher uh, that uh, uh, did his part, let's say that. Okay. Uh, we perhaps didn't do our part. Then my senior year, uh, we had a new ag teacher that was fresh out of OSU, and, and I think he had one teaching job before he got here, and uh, he really uh, put some fire on us to try and be somebody, try to do something uh, that we taught you. And I wished I'd have had that earlier, but uh, yeah, it uh, it was an influence. Certainly. I was going to say, who, 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 who was your primary influencers at that point? So, Name? would have been him. Well, it would have been him. Jim Woody uh, later became uh, uh, a superintendent of Oklahoma Union Schools uh, and several other schools before Oklahoma Union was, was uh, formed. But yeah, he had a, he had a uh, you can do better, you can do it attitude that prompted us. Okay. Yeah, encouraged, I guess you'd say. And then why OSU? Because it was ag related? Yeah, ag -related. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just asking. Just yeah. making sure. Is there other schools around? No. <laughs> I live on the Kansas border, but like I said, I, I, it, it would have been astronomical to pay to go to K State uh, as you, opposed to. Even Oklahoma though you're State. a mile from the yeah. state line? Yeah, two miles. Two miles. Yeah. So, yeah, Oklahoma State. Okay, so you got married in 74. 74. And she came to the farm. Yes. So pick up, pick up there. Well, we started having boys in 75. We've got three sons. Uh, about every three, three and a half years, we would have another son. And uh, 
I kept looking for that little girl, but we never did, never did get it. But anyway, we've got three sons, uh, Ben, and raised them through the 80s. Uh, I'll get back to the 80s story I referred to earlier. Okay. Uh, farming was pretty good in the 70s. Uh, prices were good and, and crops were, were good. So we were making an uh, effort to uh, uh, grow, if you would, like everybody. But then the 80s came and we had drought in the 81, 80, 81, 82, uh, extreme drought. And uh, for us in the eastern side, uh, and consequently, interest rates went 18 to 20 percent. And uh, we kept farming, obviously, having to borrow money, and combined with uh, declining crops from the drought, it got super tough. Uh, I learned then the meaning that. It's no sin to be poor, it's just inconvenient. Mm -hmm. And believe me, it was inconvenient. Uh, the boys were young uh, at that time. Our machinery was older. Uh, the drought hit us. Uh, the interest was compounding on us. It was super tough. Lots of, lots of folks went out of business in the mid, early to mid 80s. Um, it was just a given that uh, you were going to have a difficult time. We managed to hang on somehow by the grace of God. Uh, I th honestly think we went broke probably twice and I didn't realize it. We just kept gritting it out and we're going to make it, you know. And we did uh, make it through those 80s. So I tell you this to say when you've raised three sons, in tough times, it's hard to convince them to stay on the farm and work with dad mm -hmm. later because it's just a tough old deal. Farmers sometimes don't get their payments until uh, fall or midsummer. And then when you are forbidden to get that income from a drought, uh, it, it compounds. And again, with that interest compounding, it, it was a tough deal. So any farmer uh, and rancher in, in Oklahoma, in, anywhere, that survived through those 80s have, uh, have got some miles behind them. Mm -hmm. And I've got some hard miles. So uh, looking back, uh, I don't know what I could have done different. But uh, anyway, we survived it. As the boys got older, uh, they all played sports, of course. Uh, we, we had about a 10-year run of uh, football, basketball, baseball. Uh, come Friday night, uh, I, didn't, I didn't care what. What I was doing. Uh, we went to the ball game. And I get choked up a little on that because uh, my dad never did. He was so busy and providing for the family that uh, I don't remember him going too many uh, ball games I had. So Joe and I both played sports in, in high school and we both declared if they play sports, we're going. Yeah. And we did. Loved it. Yeah. Ten years worth. Looking back, uh, did I miss out on some farming? No. Is there the next day? And we just worked a little harder to recapture it. So anyway, I would give advice to any young farmer, any young person, don't let the jobs at hand get in the way of your family. Mm -hmm. Take your time. So we did. So anyway, that brings us up to... Did you have to sell any property during the 80s? We did. During the 80s? We did. One of the dreams I had, because we grew up on 20 acres, we, me, uh, my family, 20 acres with, was rented ground, so there was no uh, starting point for me. Uh, but yet I was going to make it one way or another. And uh, we rented ground, and I declared in my mind that when I was 40 years old, I was going to own a thousand acres. Man, that's a, that's a pipe dream, but that's what I want to do. So I was working toward that, but 
again, uh, reflecting back to those 80s, uh, it threw a big curve in that. So we had land that we owed and was trying to pay for and hold it all together and end up having to sell uh, some land to survive. And, and it's the only way we could have. So. Did either one of you have jobs off of the farm during that time? I've never worked in town. Uh, my wife uh, was raising boys, uh, so uh, no, she didn't at that time. Later when they got out of high school, she did. So being on the farm during that time period, you could have a garden and oh, yeah. sustain yourself. And yeah. in that category, it, more than some people could, I guess. Yeah, we did. Uh, I didn't milk a cow. I didn't care if I ever milked a cow. <laughs> uh, I, I can buy milk, you know, and, and go that way. So we, uh, yeah, we had garden, a typical farm type garden. and. Uh, and sweet corn, uh, I dearly love sweet corn, uh, but so do the coons around here, <laughs> the four-legged coons. And in this river bottom, we live up amongst a lot of woods and the river's uh, a little over half a mile. So come uh, sweet corn picking time, uh, they would be here about three days before we would, <laughs> the coons would, because they know uh, just exactly. <sighs> How to, how to raid that corn. And uh, so anyway, that's just a corn story, but. Any way to prevent that or slow it oh, down? Oh, we tried everything. They talked about uh, putting human hair, you know, cut your hair, scatter the hair, and you know, various uh, old ideas. And, and no, they didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> they still got it. So we would have a tendency, I would have a tendency to overplant more than we ever would need just to let us have, you know, every 15th year and so to compensate. But sometimes that didn't even work because a coon will, will show up and then tomorrow night he's got all of his family there together. And then the third night he brings in the block party, you know, they're all having a big thing. So literally just destroy cornfields, sweet corn. <laughs> I think if I could develop a rollout hot wire system that was easy to handle, we could probably market that to Walmart. I've always heard of the hot wire, you know, stringing hot wire two times, whatever. And I think with some success, but I never did try that. Uh, I, I just never did. <laughs> like an electric fence, is that what yeah, you mean? An electric hot fence, wire. yeah, hot wire. But if I had something that just roll up in a tube, you know, for nine ninety five, but wait, if you buy two, <laughs> one of those kind of deals, I could sell those and put around sweet corn fields and plug it in, and you'd probably be, uh, I wouldn't have to farm so hard. Did you buy coon dogs to take up coon dogs? Yeah, you might tie a coon dog up and <laughs> give him a long rope. But the thing about that, when that coon dog goes out and swipes around, he's going to break every one of those stocks over. So it's just not an easy answer. <laughs> But we do love corn. One of the challenges. Are, yeah. yeah. So at, at what point did you get involved with conservation? How, how early on? Well, I was a young man. Uh, I think about 27, actually. Uh, and the way that I did, uh, just to the east of us across the river, starts big blue stem country, ranch country. And a uh, uh, quick thing about Nowata County is most of majority of the farmland is through the river bottoms. There is prairie lands that are farmed, but not consistent with say central Oklahoma or west because we deal with more trees. And the big blue stem grass country is just over the hill, it's just five miles. So I had a rancher friend, uh, Harry Lynn, that was uh, on the Nowata County Conservation District board, and he was wanting to go off. Uh, an older, older gentleman, he really wasn't that old at that time, but he wanted to go off. And he had, I guess, enjoyed seeing me farming along here, raising corn. He always talked about, I see you're growing me some horse corn. <laughs> he always called it horse corn. And I said, uh, Harry, uh, I, 
we're growing corn, all right, because that's all we know how to do is corn and beans. He said, you know, you're doing some conservation work around, uh, would you be interested in taking my place at the Conservation District Board? And like I said, I'm 27, uh, young, and, and uh, I thought, yeah, I would be. Uh, so to make a longer story shorter, uh, they appointed me to take his place because it was not up yet. He was in an elected position, but it wasn't up, so I served another year or so. And then I had to go up for election and was elected to that board at that time. I think that was probably 43 years ago or so. And you're still on it. I'm still going. Uh, whether that's good or bad, that's the, the judge is still out. But the point is, this older gentleman saw something in me to put me in there with what I thought was four other old men, and they were older. They were probably in their 50s. <laughs> I thought, gee, man, here I am, this, you know, my dad's age. But I learned from those old gentlemen uh, very quickly. Uh, they put quite a load on me at times, just uh, stuff that didn't happen to happen, but just in fun. But anyway, I learned from those gentlemen as one would go off, then uh, a new person would come on, uh, which was somewhat younger. You know, here I am as an old guy now talking about that, but I know from then looking up, uh, they were a lot younger than I were at this point. But uh, that's how I got started uh, to stay on that long. I still enjoy it, serving on the board. Uh, still enjoy making conservation happen here in Oda County and in Oklahoma. It's the right thing to do. I know that. So, in those forty years, were there many? Have you seen any changes? Yeah, I have. Uh, some of those changes uh, would have to deal with financing from the state. Uh, obviously, those. Uh, allocations have been reduced and now you're expected to do more with less. Uh, the people that have served uh, in the commission, for instance, uh, have, have been combined and dwindled to where the staff is, is minimal, so to speak, yet doing an outstanding job. In our county-wide efforts, uh, same way. Uh, our district secretary, for instance, uh, Brenda's been there, uh, I think, over 30 years, maybe 35. But it come time for her to retire, even as a young lady. Uh, so when she retired, which I encourage her to do because it's time to her to enjoy what she wants to do, working there every day. But when she retires, uh, there's no replacement. You, you don't get anybody to replace it. So what do we do? Well, we combine with actually no other county in Washington County, which is uh, uh, just 20 miles, Caney Valley Conservation District. Uh, we share a secretary. Uh, we get two days a week. And I think Caney Valley gets three. And this is going on statewide. As someone retires, uh, unless there's an absolute uh, critical need area uh, for instance, multiple watersheds or, or abandoned mine lands or whatever. If there isn't anything out of the normal, they probably don't get replaced. They share with an adjoining uh, county. So these are some of the things we've seen. Uh, I look back in the, uh, in the 70s and 80s uh, when conservation monies uh, came, if I remember right, through... Uh, uh, ASCS, Agriculture Stabilization Conservation Program, which was FSA now. So I think it was ACP money. Uh, and it was pretty uh, easy, I guess you would say, to get the money to do your conservation work, your waterways, terraces, grass plain. That has gone away and been replaced with state cost share monies through the commission. So now we are able to take blocks of money, give it to each county, 
that will utilize it to uh, uh, make conservation work in their area. And the reason why it's each county because each county is different. Mm -hmm. And those five board members for that county make that decision on what they should do uh, to better enhance the environment in their area. So we're different than uh, Osage, for instance, Osage County. Uh, we are different than uh, certainly when you get to the far west, completely different set of standards. Those fellows have to do and ladies have to work according to what they see the needs of and not what a state commission says, you're gonna do this, you're gonna do that. See, so it works out of way. So these are changes that I've seen. Um, the clientele that we are working for, uh, meaning landowners, have changed tremendously. There were so many more farms and even ranches back then than there is now. So you have absentee landowners, which means someone in Colorado owns that farm next door, or you know, someone in Utah owns that place. So you're dealing with those folks trying to get conservation on their land, uh, maybe through the renter or the leasor. And so the clientele is a little different. The way we have to handle things is a little different, countywide and statewide. So these are ideas that we never thought we'd deal with, but they're, they're coming. Now, what's in the future? Uh, nobody knows, but everything may be digital. Uh, we may be interviewing or soliciting conservation work with that person in Colorado or Utah via satellite phone and we're, I mean, these things obviously are coming. Uh, we may not ever see that person or shake that person's hand or look that person in the eye, yet conservation has to go on because the land's still there. If we just let it go, it's going to go away. It's going to grow up in trees. Cedars are going to take us. Water's going to, I mean, I sound like I'm preaching, but <laughs> the fact is, it's, it's a staple that we all got to have. Mm -hmm. And whoever owns it 50 years from now has still got to put conservation on that land. So. Well, what in particular has been the issues in this county, in your county? Well, erosion and water? Yeah, in the, in the early days, there was so much farming that, that uh, uh, soil erosion was probably the highlight. As time went on and more farms were put to grass and, and, and the masses changed to more livestock because some of this ground wasn't suited to farm. It should have never been broken out to begin with, mm -hmm. but it was, but they put it back. So it went from that to now that grass is out there and how are we gonna get rid of some of those uh, corruptive grasses uh, brush, uh, Les Fadiza, you know, uh, Cerisa Les Fadiza, uh, uh, Thorny Locust, uh, Must Thistle. All these things are coming back uh, or have started. So now we've got to go into a defensive uh, control methods and in this county uh, certainly puts that high on the list. Whereas ponds, and terraces that were at the high list in the, in the 80s and 90s mm -hmm. are now at the low list because these have taken more priority to save what we've got, the big blue stems, uh, and, the, and the ranch folks have really taken a hold of that. So these are some of the changes I, I know have taken place. I've seen it. So, yeah, we're still... Still fighting with them. <laughs> do you do prescribed burns up in this? Yes, there is. Some, there is prescribed burns, uh, which is a very good thing. Uh, I know some of the ranchers don't want to do it every year. Uh, we can bank on 40 inches a year rainfall, but uh, that may come in five events <laughs> and, you know, not happen anymore. Yeah. So 
they want to, you know, control some of that uh, dryness maybe through the winter. That way, but yeah, they do prescribe urns uh, readily. Did you get your thousand acres by the time you were forty? No, I think I had eight hundred and some uh, at that time, and was looking at another place. <laughs> Got close, <laughs> but but you know when you're in debt this deep, you soon gonna realize uh, it ain't gonna happen, and you've got to make some adjustments in life, and I did. And, and fortunately, uh, here we are today. Uh, we farm just under 2,000 acres. Uh, lots of it uh, rented, of course, but I've rented some of that for 40 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the opportunity is here for my sons to, to farm. Mm -hmm. But as I told them when they graduated high school, you're going to go to college you're going to graduate and you're going to get a real job. <laughs> real job meaning a paycheck. And they did. And, uh, and now I'm at the point of someday return. I don't see it soon, but uh, I still love the farm every day. I still love to get up the farm. 70 years old. The old guy, you know, all my friends are saying, why don't you retire? Well, what am I going to do? I still love the farm. I love to be with people. Uh, so they have the opportunities to come if they want, but I'm never going to say, boys, you're coming back. Mm -hmm. yes. It won't work. It won't work. Well, I have to ask that any of them go to OSU. Yes. My oldest son, uh, did a scholarship to OSU and graduated with Ag Econ degree and his junior year in, in college, uh, interned with John Deere mm -hmm. out of Dallas. And uh, I don't know, he's been working with them ever since. Uh, I'm not sure what his title is. Or Does he get you a discount on the, on the equipment? Absolutely not. <laughs> I don't get any help whatsoever, even on uh, mental things. <laughs> but he's, he's, uh, he services all the, the dealers from Enid to Fort Smith. Uh, wow. Yeah, and has done that, gosh, since he got out of school. He's 44. So in the farm in December. Yeah, he's still in the farm. The the and now we're talking about sons. Uh, Tyler, my middle son, lives at Coeta in Wagner County, and he's got a small trucking company uh, that he runs. Uh, he's got a driver that runs with him, and, and typically home at night uh, with two of our grandchildren, a uh, boy and a girl, and the youngest son. Uh, Tyler graduated from Northeastern State at Tahlequah with a safety management. <laughs> then Clint, the youngest son, also graduated from Northeastern with a history degree, but he never wanted to teach. He got a teaching degree. And he got into the Park Service uh, right out of the bat. And at that time, there was a hiring freeze uh, by the president, you know, in those earlier years of his life. And so he kept plugging away and finally they opened it up where he could get hired and uh, <clears throat> he uh, is now in uh, in uh, johnson city texas and he manages the uh, lyndon johnson ranch lbj ranch uh, which after lady bird passed away uh, they deeded part of that ranch to the park service mm -hmm. and that opened up and uh, he was in uh, big thicket uh, National Preserve in Beaumont, Texas, which that's another story. Preserve against conserve is two different words. But anyway, he had that opening and they hired him and he's been in there 14 years now he manages the ranch. So, so his time on the farm paid paid It did. Him and handy uh, too. I went down the first year and visited with his boss, which is a cowboy that grew up there around the ranch, LBJ's ranch, and been there ever since. And there was a manager, and he, he says, you know, Clint can, can talk. He can tell all about the ranch when the buses come in. He says, I push him out there. He said, come time to, to plow some ground or, or disc it to put hay in, I push him out there. Uh, when it comes hay in time, I push him out there. <laughs> he says, all I want to do is horseback. And he said, you got any more sons you want to sit down? <laughs> I said, well, I've got two more sons that are 
well educated in agriculture the tough way, but uh, no, they won't be coming down here. So, but they loved him, and and uh, I guess he's kind of like me. You can visit with a fence post and enjoy it. So, uh, hard worker. So that's where he's at. So, that's the three boys. So you mentioned the difference between preserve and conserve. Do you want to? Yeah, get we'll into elaborate that? on that. <laughs> I never really knew uh, the, the distinct difference. You know, we we talk about preserving that grass or conserving that grass. The difference in preserve and conserve, in my opinion, preserve it, you don't touch it. You leave it be, it is as is. For instance, I went down to the Big Ticket National Preserve in north of Beaumont and a hurricane had gone through there just a few years before and those large trees that fell were still there, everywhere. Trash, not trash, but trash from the trees. Mm -hmm. I said, Clint, why don't they get this cleaned up? You know, we think at home, something goes down, we're gonna clean it up and we're gonna get on with it. Dad, you can't, it's a preserve. You leave it there as nature let it be. So they would had trails through this nature preserve and here would be a big old tree fell down and they'd cut a chunk out of it where you could walk through it, but that tree's still there and will be 40 years from now. So that's preserve. Conserve, conservation, is to best utilize that as we can, but conserving what we need it to do to continue on through life. So I had an opening there in my vision and mental that preserve and conserve are truly two different things, you see. So conservation, we're not wanting to just don't use it, we're wanting to enable others to use it later on and use it wisely now, so we're conserving. So that is in water, that's in soil, that's in anything, so yeah. So what, do you, what was the earliest conservation practice you instituted, do you recall? Yes, <clears throat> actually, I was a part of some rented land uh, just north of us up here on a hillside, and we would dearly love to purchase that ground now, but the old gentleman doesn't want to sell it. But I farmed it so long that his mother was living there, and she couldn't afford anything. And actually, we got uh, SCS then, Soil Conservation Service, to lay out the terraces on this hillside ground, which is excellent ground. And I told her, I think we can probably get this built where it won't cost you anything, even with the cost share money. So I found an operator that was a, the best dozer guy around that I. I believe. And he actually built those terraces and that waterway for the 60% cost share money that they provided. He was that good, that fast. And so she got a complete terrace system on 40 acres and a waterway uh, uh, free of any debt to her. So I guess I was instrumental in that, but then I took that one step farther, just across the fence on my place up here, which was a gentle slope, but a long gentle slope. And at that time we were full till, uh, plowed disc, spring tube like everyone else. Uh, but I built it with plow, my own plow, and literally got that system up to specs with the Soil Conservation Service, and got paid on that, and I was the, the, the doser operator with my plow. Mm -hmm. So I knew I could do it, and, and so that was my earliest recollection. Since then, we've had other systems put in with dozers and you know, drive on. But and most of your properties in river, bottom, river bottom? Yes, uh, we're sitting on the hill here, and uh, in fact, we're converting a pasture here uh, since we don't have cows anymore. Uh, my last little 
12 acre piece here is going to be till next year. But it's on the hill, but the majority is in the bottom, yes. Out of the 2,000 acres, uh, I think we're probably 70% bottom land, maybe 80%, and 20% prairie land. I call prairie land upland, so it doesn't flood. Has there been particular issues that you've had to deal with being in the river bottom? <laughs> Funny that you ask. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the criteria on floods are, are normal floods or 100 year floods. And we've seen 200 year floods here in July 4th, 1976, and October 1st in 1986, 10 years apart, 100 year floods. So we were well familiar with, with high water. And the normal floods you get are typical three days. They're up, stay on one day, and down the next. And so we've seen lots of those on this Vertigus River system. Uh, but like I said, in 76, uh, there was a 100 year flood. In October of 86, 100 year flood. So I began to question what is a 100 year flood? What's the duration here? We had 10 years apart. so. Uh, never get a real good answer on that. But then time went along to 2007, and uh, we're, our 100 year flood, which I know the line is just right out here in our drive, so I'm not panicking. And they talked about uh, that Saturday evening on June the 30th of an uh, incredible amount of rain, about 60 miles north of here, uh, 21 inches. Mm. And uh, in a two day period. And uh, so that Saturday, they were saying severe flooding, which again, I thought 100 year flood. And <clears throat> I got on a computer, which I monitor the river level at Independence, Kansas upstream, uh, and also the Elk City Lake, which is, is a typical big, large federal lake. And, and the lake was full before the rain. And, or the flood pool was starting to fill, let's say. And they got that rain, and at 10 o'clock that night, uh, it had raised uh, 12 feet at the Independence uh, Water Treatment Plant. The river had raised 12 feet in one hour. And I knew something was, was happening. It's usually a 24-hour period to get down here to this farm from, from 22 miles north. I told my wife, Joe, I said, this is not right. Uh, we're going to see some real flooding tomorrow. So our plans was to go to bed, get up next morning, go to church, get back home, you know, 24 hours, and we'll start watching this flood water. We got up at 6 on Sunday morning, and it was already at the 100-year flood stage that quick. With a wall of water that came into that lake, <clears throat> and they had to literally jerked the gates open to save the dam, and it come roaring down through the Vertigus River, inundated Coffeville, the whole east side of Coffeville was flooded. When it went through, uh, it, it wiped out some, some, it didn't wipe out an oil tank. They had to abandon the refinery so fast that they had some oil got loose and kept running and running and running, and so therefore it got on the water floated south, and we're the first farmstead in Oklahoma that received a lot of that oil and or bad chemicals from the refinery that they didn't know exactly what was. So we were looking at the next morning with floodwaters right outside here. Uh, we had a mobile home that we actually lived in right here in this place that was uh, about four foot lower than what we are now. And uh, so we'll be all right, you know, it's gonna flow down there to while. Oil slick was on the top. Mm. Uh, this was in late June, so we had wheat stubble in all the fences. Uh, oil, you know, oil will collect on everything like that. So we stayed here till that evening and spent all day in the water roping, hooking, anything we could, dual wheels, fuel tanks. They were starting to float off because it was just 
kept coming up the hill, coming up the hill. So we had quite an experience with the flood. Uh, we were going to stay in the barn that night. It's out here on the hill. We'll be all right. By about six o'clock that evening, the water was still coming up, still coming up. It was coming up to the barn. And it was only about six foot out away from the barn. And I had to call a boat and uh, they sent a boat uh, down the highway, right into the barn. We got in with our suitcase and headed back to the highway. And the highway you turned off up to come east, uh, grabbed a stop sign there and stepped out on the highway. That's a high it got that fast. So was it a hundred year flood times 10? Who knows? It had to be a 500 year flood. We were five foot higher here than our hundred year floods were in 86 and 76. Five foot. So that was a real wake up. Uh, I've always considered us river rats because we live on the river, <laughs> but that's unacceptable. <laughs> that is, it changing a lot of uh, things. And anyway, when the water uh, totaled out then that next morning, uh, our, our mobile home had oil in it. It was wicking up the walls. Uh, everything had oil. Uh, a little story about EPA, uh, Region 6 and Region 7 is right here at the state line. And 7 out of, out of Kansas area closed Coffeville off. Literally, the National Guard uh, circled that whole flood area. Nobody was to go back in on that contaminated land. Yet, we are across the line and had waited in it all day and, and literally saving stuff. So it was like reading six didn't know what reading seven was doing. We got a flood up here, but you know, we're across the border, so mm -hmm. must not have flooded to the south. But anyway, we went through that and endured it, and uh, I don't have any occurrences, uh, none of us did, from sickness or anything like that, but uh, we really went through a devastating flood. We farmed uh, all this land, uh, like I said, out of a little under 2,000 acres, and we harvested 13 acres that summer, wow. that okay. fall. I really thought it was over, my farm career. Uh, you know, we still had uh, debts that we needed to pay and uh, how do you get started back, you know, but, uh, you, you know, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta say, uh, God took this in his hand and, and turned it around because it was nothing we did. But he also opened our eyes to the many, many friendships that, that we had. Uh, conservation family to the state of Oklahoma it was just incredible in the gifts that they give us and the support. Uh, this house was, was put up uh, in July we started. A uh, neighbor that I graduated with uh, just lives a mile east and went like 40 some miles to get back here. Uh, when we when the water went down and he said, man, you're going to need a house. And I said, yeah, we are, but with what, you know? Yeah, we're going to make it happen. And so he did. Uh, he got with, he was a contractor, and got with uh, three other contractors. And before we knew it, there was a pad here. We raised it four foot I was gonna ask to you. set it on. And then, of course, the house concrete's higher than that. So we're above that, that flood level then. And long story short, which it is a long, incredible story about how this house was built. In November, we, we came into this house, and, and it's like you said today, that quick. Labor was all contributed. Uh, my goodness, it's just incredible. We had friends that laid tile and did cabinets and, you know, on and on, just a shower of blessings. So uh, God's good and, and it's a real deal. It's, a, it's a, you know, we, we did have FEMA come here because mm -hmm. once they declared the oil a disaster type thing, mm -hmm. uh, FEMA was able to come in and, and we did get uh, some payment. 
And then that allowed you to open the door to a small business administration for a home loan at very low interest. And we did that, jumped through those hoops quickly. And uh, with the help that we had through this entire state uh, of, of conservation friends, uh, uh, we, we made it through and, and we're back on our feet. And so it was a, it was a, a bad experience but it was a very good experience when it was done. So. Well, what did you have to do to the land to get rid of that oil part? Hardly nothing. Uh, people get scared of, of oil to see oil on land, but uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go away about a grade, I guess, over time. Uh, the hazard isn't in the oil, in my opinion. It was in the acids and things at the co-op mm -hmm. when it flushed through there, it never, it never flushed and, and it flushed through there. So those things went away, I think in the first mile or two, probably got attached to leaves and, and whatever. I don't think we had any down through here other than the oil. So we collected the straw that was on the fence, the wheat straw, and burned it and uh, picked up everything else and burn it, uh, only as a farmer would do, not knowing any difference. Uh, I don't know if it was a, a, a credible thing to do uh, for the environment, but it had to be done. And uh, so we just picked up and, and, and went, you know, started, started putting things back together. We hauled shale in. I had a friend that I helped raise uh, as a young man, we taught him farmer and all, and I guess he remembered that because he was one of the first ones that came. He said, uh, we're gonna, you're going to need a lot of shale to build pad here. He said, I, I'm going to get you going. And, mm. You know, he had like six dump trucks and a dozer. And so they could get all this and and do it in one day, you know, build this huge pad for this this house and gives me the bill and it's, you know, 7,500 bucks. And I said, well, I could be a little off what I'm telling you. He said, made and full. So we were off and running. Did you just have to yeah. pay, it, pay it forward then? Pay it forward. And believe me, I have tried to do that since. I look for the opportunity to help someone and have. But can I have some corn? Is, yes. <laughs> if yes. you can beat the coons to it, you yep. can have some corn. Yep. I've got lots of soybeans and I utilize those in those efforts. Yeah. So the oil into the land didn't impact did the, how hurt, the crops grew the next, did not next season? Did anything. Not at all. It was so minute compared to the overall, even though it was black, but uh, no. It, oil floats, so most of it went away, but this got hung up in here and painted everything, literally painted mm. everything. The EPA out of Caulfield, it wasn't EPA, it was... Uh, the refinery out of Cogginville uh, came down with a set of EPA workers that cleaned up Cogginville. <laughs> we had to grin uh, when they came down to clean up, uh, power wash the oil and the machinery and anything that had the oil on because they were wearing their bona fide suits and their masks and looked like spacewalkers washing this stuff more standing around our t-shirts and shirts and yeah go for it you know <laughs> so <laughs> if <laughs> we never did uh, have any effects of it but i know they have a protocol they have to go through and they yeah. did what they did so and we were appreciative of it to clean up but uh, that's that's how it kind of got washed away i've still got some spots in my uh, little out milling here when you open the door, that the oil line's still there, just as a reminder that uh, don't think you're so good that you can avoid a flood because it can still come back. So, yeah. So you've had to deal with several floods. If you had to, did you change anything on your property to no. slow it down or? You know? No, it had never, never got that high again. Uh, yeah, we're going to see some hundred-year floods. We almost a hundred-year flood. In May or June yeah. this year, it got within an inch or two. But after going through the 07 flood, it was like, okay, it's flooded. So, 
but it was under 11 days. And that was devastating on a knee-high corn crop that we had. It, when it went off, it was gone. It was mapped to the ground, silt was over. And, you know, but again, we walked that trail many times and you just get on your tractor and get started and get to replant. Fortunately, it came early June. We had time to heal. Whereas in 07, it was July. So once that 30 day period came to dry out, it was too late to do anything then. So, yeah. So there's, you know, there's brighter days, there's brighter days. Time for a vacation. <laughs> well, yeah, we've enjoyed a few of those too. <laughs> do you do any no-till? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because of the 07 flood, uh, we uh, had so many acres to get over and was devastated. So I knew there had to be another way to do this. A good friend of mine from Benita, Jay Franklin, uh, tried to preach no-till to me for years on this old tough black river bottom. Like, yeah, it won't work, it won't work. It will work. So I remembered that. And uh, a year or so after the flood, uh, we started no tilling. Actually, it was, uh, yeah, about two or three years after the flood. We started no tilling and, and have never looked back. Uh, we, we, we farmed 2,000 acres and it's total no till. We've proven that it works in the bottoms. It certainly works on the prairie. Uh, I entered the yield contest for corn. I love to grow corn in Oklahoma. And, and that's with the nice of corn growers. And I've been successful in winning that several times with no-till. Mm. Dry land, no-till. We've had some incredible good yields. And so, yes, it will work. And, and later uh, came the warm and fuzzy notion of cover crops. Cover crops. Didn't they do that in the 40s? Yeah, they did, but not to the extent, and they probably didn't realize why they were doing it, the good to the ground. But today, uh, we're in our third year of cover crops, and that is combined with no-till. And uh, so, yes, those opportunities exist for everybody. It's just a matter of education, I think. And readily shown return on investment because you're investing quite a little bit in in cover crops and it's something that you can't get a tangible dollar figure for with all the things that go on underneath the earth's surface that we don't know about we're learning about and earthworms and all the microbes and and the good that it's doing underneath uh, to conserve if you will uh, this land that we have. So, yeah, I'm a uh, um, ninth year no tiller, I guess, and uh, third year cover cropper. So, uh, we're getting ready to, uh, uh, well, let me back up. After the flood this year, uh, we had time to go in and plant soybeans on basically every acre we had. We've got, I don't know, 1,750 acres of soybeans to harvest. They came in with a program this year through EQUIP to seed, help seed uh, cover crops. So I enlisted in that back in probably March or April because I was going to have 600 acres of corn, 650, and all that was going to be cover crops. So I wrote down 540 acres that I'm going to get into this program with. Well, then we lost all of our corn. So that threw a little bit of a wrench in it because it had to follow with soybeans, which meant that soybeans are going to come off later, frost, and you need to cover crops in uh, early enough to get some growth for the fall. And uh, so I visited with my uh, NRCS personnel which are, are very good folks. And they said, 
uh, you know, you can, you can, you, you can make it work, but it has to be in, you know, basically the first part of October. I said, the only way we can do that is to fly these on. I said that. And I knew they had done this before, so we're getting ready uh, next Tuesday to fly on uh, rye and uh, uh, turnips and radishes on uh, 540 acres. Mm -hmm. We're going to fly on to these soybeans as a change in colors, the leaves, and then when that leaf drops, uh, the seed will already be shipped down, but once it drops, it covers that seed and get a little moisture and, and up it'll come. So mm -hmm. that's how we're gonna make it work this year because it would have been easy if the corn was there, the corn come off in September, we get the drill from and we drill all this and it's a done deal. Mm -hmm. I've got about a hundred acres like that planted and it's up good, but this flying deal is gonna be an interesting adventure. Like a, like a crop duster type? Like a crop duster, I'm gonna carry a big, a vessel of uh, seed and blows it out. So we're fixing to find out. <laughs> we came a week too early. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think next Tuesday or Wednesday we're going to do it. I'll be able to nail that down. But, so oh, that'll be interesting. Some of my conservation ventures, you know. Yeah, and then the other one you do the cover crop to tabletop. I have done that. Uh, <laughs> We did not get that done this year due to the flood, mainly because of through the timing off on so many things. But last year we planted uh, two acres. They, they, they want you to set aside two acres, which any farmer can do, and plant that cover crop in there. But within that cover crop is an edible crop, such as in the fall would be pumpkins and squash and various things like this and we did and they called it a chaos garden i said why is it called a chaos garden well just wait and see <laughs> so we planted the seed and uh, there's probably 10 uh, different uh, species uh, and there was uh, some kind of miniature corn uh, there was some extra large milo that grew way up. There was flower plants, uh, canola. I mean, you name it, it was kind of in that mix. Okra, squash, pumpkins, several different kinds of squash. And believe me, it looked like a chaos deal. And fortunately, I set it far enough off the roadside to where they didn't think Herman was absolutely losing it all now. <laughs> Because we had two acres that normal people would have bush off down, but <laughs> I knew it was a chaos garden and we we're going to do it. So we went along and, and uh, it was coming toward harvest time. And I told my NRCS personnel and they said, well, we'll, we'll get together and furnish some people to pick. And, and our conservation board, uh, most of those fellas come up. And anyway, we had about 17 pickers and uh, the Tulsa Food Bank uh, truck arrived with with big containers to put it in and then a local chapter uh, of a food bank here at Lunapaw in Delaware County had come up and we commenced to go pick the Chaos Garden and believe me it was very fun very interesting we ended up picking two trailer loads and they weighed it and it was 4,300 pounds of food for the public coming out of the chaos garden. So it was a very eye opening, uh, heartfelt uh, picking day and, and very rewarding. So I'd do it again in, in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. We would have this year, but like I said, it just didn't pan out. I'd love to do one in the spring with tomatoes, okra, you know, peas, anything, because anything would grow here with the rainfall we get. But you also have to have pickers. And 
and like okra, you know, it's kind of a weekly piece, yeah. you know, how that is. So maybe we can work the details out on that, but I'd be glad to furnish the land. Mm. Yeah. Well, who furnished this, the seed for the cake? The seed was, uh, came through NRCS or the conservation districts from Green Cover Seed out of Nebraska. They donated the seed for this mm. venture, uh, Chaos uh, Adventure. And uh, so the seed was, was sponsored by them or passed on by them. I think through OACD probably. And then uh, they said, here it is, you know, and I'm thinking two acres and it was in two pack sacks. And I got a 30 foot drill, so how are we gonna do this, <laughs> you know? Well, my drill, each hole has got a bridge that goes up between them so it'll clean up good. So my wife and I went out and absolutely weighed these things out. And there's 42 holes or whatever there is and divided each one of those wow. to go into that and went with a 30 foot drill and drill two acres. And it worked. So uh, we got it done and and like I said, the harvest was just, uh, as with any harvest, it's just an incredible time of year to, to see it. So. Mm -hmm. And knowing you're doing something good too. So yeah, it's fun. I'm ready to do it again. I'd advise anybody to, mm -hmm. to do that. I mean, we all can spare two acres. Yeah, so the only expense was your time plus, plus time. gas to run the, the, the and planet. The, yeah, which is nothing, but you, you, you know, yeah, you give up two acres of income, possible. Uh, that you would have raised a crop with, but uh, this is good investment. Hmm. This is good investment. If you can help feed someone that's deprived, uh, you know, we, we're so blessed. So two acres ain't gonna hurt anybody. Well, and, and the cover crop that you're doing with radishes and turnips? Radish and turnips. Will you harvest those? No, ma'am. Uh, like the wheat, or not the wheat, but uh, the, the the rye, uh, we're putting on 20 pounds of rye per acre. So that's enough to keep it green out there. Uh, normally if you can harvest some, you'd, you'd have way more, 60 to 90 pounds of seed maybe per acre, but 20 pounds enough to activate the green growth in this, in this field. Rye has a real aggressive and heavy root mass and goes deep. So that's protecting the land as well as going deep. The radishes at three pounds an acre is going to go deep in the soil with a tap root. Mm. And also that radish may be like a ball bat. If you kind of think of a ball bat, it'll go down pretty deep. Uh, some of it grows above ground, but it's breaking up that soil. And then the turnips the same way. It, the turnip's just gonna look like a turnip pushing that ground aside, but it has a taproot that goes deep. And the taproot's reaching down and getting fertilizers that have gone down in there that I can't get to with a regular crop, bringing it up to feed that plant. And then when winter comes, it dies in that top six inch stratus, mm -hmm. therefore leaving the fertilizer for next year's bean crop or corn crop. Now, if I was a cattleman, which I used to be, but now we don't, they would love to eat this winter those turnip tops, which are gonna be leaves as wide as your hand, lush. So they're gonna get a double whammy on that cover crop, the cattle and the benefits of the soil. So it's a good deal. It's good deal. I think more people will probably look into this as we can get some of these demonstration areas out and we're going to have enough this this fall to hopefully be able to uh, show others that it'll work on this old black ground it'll work anywhere it's always resistance to change isn't there? it is uh, we know we got compaction and we're hopefully going to fight that with that and then erosion the right uh, roots uh, in the North Country, in the I states where they've got tile, some of those fellows that have tile three foot deep, you know, to drain the soil, 
have complained about the roots getting in the tile mm -hmm. drainage and plugging them up. So those mm -hmm. roots are gonna go way down. So if it does that here, and once that dies, then where's the rainfall gonna go next year? It's gonna to try to follow some of that root, old dead root mass. So it's a it's a win-win thing, I believe. We've just got to be able to show the return on investment uh, monetarily. I mean, we know we're doing good for conservation. We know we're doing good for the tilt underneath the soil, even though we don't till it, but it's loosening up. Uh, but we, we still have to put a, a hard fact to be able to sell people. And how are you learning about this? Is it through the being on the commission or is it through being on the district board or Googling? Uh, kind of all the above. Oh, okay, the uh, main uh, person in this state uh, uh, has has really expedited this this whole movement. Uh, it has been used earlier in the northern states for no-till has been used many, many years before we got it here in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Same way with cover crops. So they have factual information. Jim Emmons, uh, from out at Leedy in the western part of the state uh, has been a real uh, minister, if you will, uh, to spread the gospel of, <laughs> of uh, cover crops. And he is, uh, uh, his place and my place are so different, it's just hard to imagine trying to even compare the two because our land is nothing like theirs. But I went out to his field day when he had his early field day and, Man, he's turning this country around out there. Uh, big old hills and, and drier area, and, but he's making it work. And so, if he can, I can. So, and if I can, you can. And down there, you can. And over there, I mean, that's the deal: is is uh, spreading the, the gospel, if you will. So you'll have a field day here. I think we may, uh, if not a. Field day. We're going to try and document this flying next week with video. Uh, literally stand in the field and let the plane go, you know, let the seed hit you and <laughs> hit the camera and, you know, showing how it's done. And then, of course, I've got the expense account to know what it's involved. So maybe we can validate some of that and then maybe take a winter picture and uh, try to use that to uh, champion the cause, if you will. We need a drone. Yeah, we've, we've, we've got a guy coming with a drone that's going to oversee and shoot this whole thing. Wow. Yeah, so hopefully it'll all pan out next week. <laughs> that's, that's neat, I think. Yep. Yep. And I don't hear that you were involved with RC and D, but I don't know what that was. Well, I was uh, Resource Conservation and Development. And that's a little different avenue than natural resource conservation, as we speak of conserving the soil and water and air. Uh, in RCND's uh, resource conservation is businesses, it's individual jobs, it's resources in an area that you're trying to conserve. In Cherokee Hills, or Cindy, I know there was other across the state in, in each quadrant, but in Cherokee Hills, or Cindy, which is in Northeast Oklahoma, Nine County, uh, it was trying to keep jobs uh, uh, local for one thing. I mean, there, it was a wide open gamut of things that you could do to better the uh, environment and, and enhance the living qualities in your area. And it was a federally funded monies that came in for each uh, arsendiary and they provided the coordinator uh, a paid uh, professional and we as a board would try to develop ideas and ways that we could enhance different areas uh, and it was statewide and it went away with federal funding, 
I'll say four or five years ago, they dropped the program in Worcester. So that pretty well dried up our area. There's still two or three in the state of Oklahoma, I think still going and working on their own. But yeah, it was a resource development uh, through that. You've had your hands at a lot of little things. I have. I, you know, I, I love to grow soybeans. I, I grow more soybeans than anything. And then I was on the soybean commission, which was later changed to the soybean board. But uh, for, I don't know, 20 years, and it just got to the point I had to stop. I, you know, let someone else come in. So, but we oversee all the, the checkoff monies in soybeans in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was very interesting. Uh, I hated, to, hated to step aside, but you know, all of us can be replaced, and some of us just need to realize it's time. So, but if you grow all those soybeans, do you drink soy milk? I do not, okay. and I don't eat soy burgers. And <laughs> Why the soy, just the beans themselves, roasted? Uh, the roasted beans, I would, yes, yeah. but <laughs> <laughs> it's not that I'm not promoting my product, but. <laughs> I'd rather show you that uh, uh, hood out there on that John Deere combine that's got soybean meal in it. You know, I can stand on that. But no, I'm not eating. I'm a beef eater. So, what's your favorite part of being on the farm? You said you still love to farm. So, what is it that? It's just absolute it? growing a crop and seeing that thing bloom, and it comes to flowering or heading or tasseling. And it's putting that ear on there, and you know you've done what you could to get where it is. And you can honestly say, I did it, you know. And it's just something about uh, the enjoyment we get, uh, not only the freedom of your own boss, but uh, you've got so many ups and downs, but all this harvest area overrides any of those bad times, you know. It's just in my blood, it always has been. Uh, it's not for everybody, but it's certainly my cup of tea. Did your dad ever describe it just like you did? I mean, was he, he enjoyed it as much as you seem to? Not like I do, yeah, because yeah, he comes through a lot of tougher times, you know. He was born in uh, 15, mm. and he went through the Depression and-, and uh, Had mules instead of tractors. Mules. Uh, I'll tell you a little story, and it, it's nothing to do with conservation, but any farmer or rancher can relate to this. My grandpa, uh, back in Calumet, uh, they always had mules they, they farmed with, and my dad was, was in high school, and they bought one of the first rubber tired Alice tractors, I guess, in the county. And they brought it home and Dad, I guess, probably drove it home. And Grandpa got on the tractor, was so proud of their new tractor, and started toward the barn. And come up to the barn, the doors were closed, and Dad was waving, stop, stop. And he went to pull him back on the steering wheel saying, whoa, whoa, and drove right through the barn door. Dad says, I'll never forget that as long as I live because Grandpa was so used to whoa on the reins and he didn't know any difference. And I tell you that because I wish my Grandpa and my dad could ride beside me today in our equipment we've got with our buddy seats and I'm hands-free, maybe on the phone, the GPS is driving the tractor, we come to the end, the bells go off the computer, we turn, we push the button, it locks it back on, takes it to the other way. If Grandpa could see that, he'd say, well, it doesn't matter if I say, well, or not, <laughs> it's gonna stop or it's gonna drive. So. I wish Dad and Grandpa could see that mm -hmm. today, what, what, we, what we are enjoying and the hard times that they had to go through to get that bushel of grain. So 
a lot of difference. And any farmer can, can relate to that. Any rancher can relate to that. To have your dad by you or even your grandpa. It's, it's a marvelous thing today. But then they look at the price of that versus the price of the mule. We won't that. tell grandpa <laughs> and dad what the price is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we won't. But, you know, it, it's such an easier uh, environment for us today. Uh, yes, it does cost. Uh, but uh, it's just the way it's got to be done. So in his day, the biggest invention was rubber tires for the tractor. Rubber tires for the tractor. That was a pretty mm -hmm. big deal because everything was steel tires, steel wheels. Mm -hmm. And man, we got rubber tires. <laughs> was the first tractor that Grandpa ever had. So just the fact that I guess it, he tore the barn doors down, he didn't tear the tractor up. <laughs> that would have been funny. <laughs> and well, in your day, what has been the biggest invention and well, innovation? Uh, I never did walk by on a horse or mule, you know, being in the 50s, uh, we had tractors. Uh, I would say uh, auto track steering and row shutoffs on sprayers and planters, uh, the guidance controls they have uh, is probably the biggest thing that I would relate to. As far as a tractor, being like it was in the 60s. I mean, it's still got a steering wheel and a clutch and a throttle. But the guidance and all the, the high-tech things they have now is is probably the biggest thing I see. Yeah. And if something goes wrong on it, you can't fix it. You have to get you somebody to come it. in. You call your specialized agent at the machinery dealer and he gives you a specialized price and it's big. <laughs> yeah, but it doesn't happen very much either, you know. Uh, when they talk about cars running like they used to, I don't want a car that runs like it used to and gets 80,000 miles and it's broke. I want one that gets 200, 250,000. That's what they are now. Same way the tractors. They're expected to go longer miles, uh, longer hours, uh, and do it more comfortably. So, and, and they are. But yes, they've got a price to Are you a John Deere or one of these other? Well, I'm primarily you? John Deere. I, <laughs> I tell people this. I shouldn't even say this in front of a camera, but I do not wear John Deere underwear, green. <laughs> I truly believe there are farmers that wear green underwear. <laughs> I don't doubt it. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, just a little joke among the community. But. <laughs> they probably are. Yeah. Their grandkids probably bought it for them. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, there's lots of good uh, machinery out there this this time. Uh, air conditioned too. Air conditioned is is wonderful. I still call. I've still got an outdoor tractor. Uh, if it doesn't have a cab on it, I just call an outdoor tractor because you are outdoors. Whereas the others are heated and cooled, and it can be. When we're combined, it can be 10 degrees and you're in there just like this because the heat's so good and it's quiet and you're watching a monitor and it's driving itself and I mean, come on. <laughs> That'd be too high tech though. Well, I don't know if you can. <laughs> you miss some of the, the nuances of the Well, the I don't know if you can get too everything. high tech. Uh, it's kind of like having too much money or going with too good looking girl. Can you, you know, one of those kinds, like in a song, can you get too much? I suppose you could, but you, know. you don't smell the the dirt as it's that's true. Up uh, that's saying. something we always enjoyed. Uh, now they tell us it was carbon dioxide, <laughs> you know, that we was loosened. <laughs> so I don't know, you know. <laughs> but yeah, we uh, it makes life more enjoyable for certain. But yeah. Do you use the mesonet to keep up with the weather? Or do you I do. I almost check the mesonet every day. Uh, we've got so many friends across the state. Uh, one of them, uh, a Carl Jett out, black, or uh, slap out. I check the slap out weather about as quick as I do mine because we're so far apart, yet uh, they've gotten good rains this summer, extraordinary rains. And uh, so I, I, I monitor that in, in other areas, but yes, I check my own, certainly. And do you have to keep up with red cedars or is, or is cedars a problem up in this? Red cedars are not the problem, they are out west. Okay. Uh, we've got other trees that take their place, but yeah, red cedar is still a menace. I mean, you're going to see a few around here. 
the way they get started here, uh, mainly in fence lines, and the way that fence line got started was from birds eating those seeds. I mean, who else is going to hang around a fence row, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So the bird lands, drops it, it sprouts a cedar, and then it it starts progressing from there. So. And do you have problems with hogs? Uh, no. The coons take care of They're them. nine <laughs> miles south of us wow. on this Burgess River. Uh-oh. Nine They're miles uh, area. So they're getting close. And that's been three years. They've still, still there and got them bad. But we have not had one yet. They're coming. We know they are. And that's going to be a real uh, problem. Uh, especially in a row crop farm like I run. Uh, down here on Highway 10, uh, nine miles south, they, they literally will go down a corn row after you plant it and they can smell the corn seed and root it up and will tear out acres of corn seed. Mm -hmm. How can they do it? Well, they've got some sense that they know how to do it. But yeah, they hogs are, are one of the larger problems that the state of Oklahoma is going to have to continue to fight. Uh, people may not know they got a hog, but they soon will. Anytime hogs get on golf courses or backyards and flyers, and I mean, they're there. Mm -hmm. So not only do we deal with it in the country, but hogs are a real problem. Well, then you're in the district. What are the, some of the hot topics for today? Like, what are you having to deal with as the board member? The well, district? yeah, hogs is one of them, uh, even though I'm kind of uh, right now on the north side of that, uh, it's coming. We've got a hog trap like other counties do. I think uh, it's, you're probably aware of that. Uh, the hog traps, uh, <clears throat> the gates came from the state. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, then we we build the, the fencing around it and have moved it around. And I had quite a bit of success. But when you think you've got 10 hogs, you know, there's still a hundred out there that you missed and then they're breeding and then they, so it's a continuous thing. It's a very bad thing. Uh, the other issue, I guess, would be uh, uh, the blackberries, uh, wild blackberries, uh, Cerisa Lespedeza, which seem to overtake areas. So we've got to get stay on that list and, and, and I mean keep that list high to continue to get rid of those. That's part of some of our Are there any abandoned mines? Is that, or is that a different have I got the abandoned mines in Noah County, there are a few on the eastern side. Uh, most of those have been taken care of in our county. Okay. Uh, AML is a very interesting program. Uh, it, it's a checkoff program from the coals that was that come out of the ground, uh, put back in to the, uh, well, the commission. Now it's got the, uh, and it continues to have uh, authority over clearing up those uh, high walls and the water holes that continue to be there. So Rogers County, of course, is, is really got lots of them. Uh, and then on over in the eastern part of the state, there are other areas where these are open mining pits. That is not uh, underground uh, uh, mines like you think of coal, but these are open pits. And they were left uh, to grow up in everything. And then the hazards of, of uh, someone falling in or going swimming, jumping in, no way to get out, so, you know, a lot of them, so it's still active. But yeah, Noah County's got some and pretty well got them to take care of, okay. pretty well. There's still a few that we need. Well, in the, in, the big, <coughs> in the big picture, what is Oklahoma known for in conservation in your, in your mind? Well, Governor Stitt has mentioned, you know, he wants to be tops in a lot of things, number one. And Oklahoma, I think, is is number one in a lot of areas, and one of them is water quality. Uh, why is that important? Well, 
just like we spoke earlier, uh, the future's going to be coming behind us and behind them. So we have to maintain good water. And our folks at the commission, uh, headed up by Shannon Phillips, uh, has proved they are number one in the nation in the uh, uh, streams that they have got cleaned up and taken off the 303 EPA three, list. Yes, the list that 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 uh, is put out. Uh, so we've 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 made that effort and 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 continue to work in that effort to to be number one literally in the nation. Uh, other areas, uh, AML, I think Robert Tool heads that for the question and, and just does a wonderful job of keeping up with. Uh, these abandoned mine lines, cleaning them up, uh, taking care of them. I know West Virginia and some other states are big in that, but uh, I think we're doing our good share here in Oklahoma. Uh, cover crops were, uh, that's the newest, uh, coolest uh, thing, but we're making great strides in trying to get that established uh, statewide. Uh, No-till is still a thing that I compare it to consolidating schools. Uh, converting people to consolidated schools is really tough. Converting people to get out of full tillage is tough. But it's coming. They're going to have to realize that uh, in order to conserve some of these uh, countries that we are farming in, countries being Eastern, Central, West, Southwest. We've got to have some, some no-till activity there or cover crops, I think, to to sustain and conserve. So, mm -hmm. yeah, these are some of the things that I believe Oklahoma's tops in. Uh, new ideas, uh, I think, continue to come out of Oklahoma for different things. Uh, uh, I'm just trying to think about the water, uh, Cheryl Cheadle and the Blue Thumb Program. Blue Thumb mm -hmm. program. Mm -hmm. Oh, what in the world has that got to do with me and being a farmer? Well, it starts beyond me. It starts with young kids. It starts with folks in the city. It starts with those people that drink that water, use that water. They're just as big a part of it as we are, as far as taking care of our waters. And over the years, uh, Cheryl has done an excellent job of uh, getting people hands-on wet. Uh, when she goes to the stream to uh, teach a, a class about what we need to be looking for in our waters and to keep them clean, uh, she'll have you in that water pretty quick. <laughs> I always tell the story about Cheryl that uh, I truly, and when I'd introduce her somewhere or whatever, uh, I think this is the only girl I know that's got web feet because she gets close to water and she is in it. So she's practicing what she preaches and uh, that therefore rubs off on the uh, kids in schools, the uh, people in the communities. Uh, they see a real need to uh, be watching out for our waters. Uh, different than our farmers and ranchers do because we're uh, looking at a different area of that, but it's it's all the same. It's about water, so I think we've done real well in promoting uh, quality waters. We got to have it for everything, don't we? We got to have it for everything. You're certainly right. Okay, for the next ten years, <coughs> what do you see? Planning in the head, like for the next ten years. For whatever. conservation. For you, or conservation. Oh, for me. Yeah, for you. Let's do for you. Well. I'm 70. I just turned 70 in June, but I hope I've got 10 more years to practice farming. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something I, of course, I, I love being in a conservation arena and working with these folks to try and do better things. But, uh, you know, it's, all like, it's not about me. It's, it's about the whole picture of the state of Oklahoma and, and what we do. But if you want to get real personal about what I want to do in the next 10 years, I want to grow 300 bushel corn to the acre 
no-till dry land, and I think I can do it. Ooh. That isn't a very high goal, but I think I can do it. Well, what are you currently? I mean, I, I don't know enough to know if that's well, how far you have to go. It, typical yields in, in this county is 80 or 90 boots an acre. And you want to go to 300 an acre? In 2014, I had 260 bushels oh, an acre and, and won the yield contest for Oklahoma. So uh, there's things out there now that I can do to enhance that. And with a given year of good rainfall, uh, right, uh, nighttime temperatures, uh, et cetera, et cetera, it's just a goal <laughs> I've got before I get to be an old man. <laughs> You asked me, and I told you. <laughs> I know it. That's, that's great. <laughs> yeah. As far as conservation, you know, I, 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 I just love the people I work with, love the, the things we, opportunities we have to, to work with. Uh, it, it's maybe not as easy as it used to be because of less people and less income, mm -hmm. but not income, but allotments, allocations from our state. But uh, just the same, the problems are the same, and, and we got to we got to carry on, carry on the task. Yep. Yep. You got any questions, Ben? Anything I haven't asked that we need to cover? No. We, we've, we've covered a lot. I've spoken yeah, way too much. No, let's check for a little before I let y'all. Well, Tanya, I would just, if I could just say that Scotty has been a leader in conservation for many, many years, including president of the Oklahoma Association of Conservation District and now a two-time commissioner. So uh, his leadership has been uh, well recognized by the people of this state and he's done a magnificent job. And you got a 2002 Master Agronomist Award from OSU uh, or something? Yeah, I guess I did. <laughs> yeah. That's been all before the major 2007 <laughs> flood. Mm -hmm. Okay, then my last question is, how do you want people to remember Scotty Harriman? <laughs> well, uh, you know, this is going to sound a little biblical, but it is. Uh, uh, there's, there's a verse in Galatians in chapter 5 that talks about fruits of the Spirit. And, and I always remember this because... It's how I'd like to see myself as well as other people when I view them. And it's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. So what does that mean? Uh, that means I need to be patient. I need to love others. I need to show some kindness. I understand that everybody's got their own problems. Uh, and then self-control. Get a hold of yourself and realize it's not all about me. It's about those that were around. So I hope when I walk away, uh, pass away, uh, they will say, uh, yes, he exhibited some of these features. So I strive to keep, continue to work on them. So, you know, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. You've heard that before. Mm -hmm. And that's the truth. Uh, I don't know a lot, but I sure don't care about you, anybody that I'm around. So that's what I'm gonna hopefully go out with. Uh, I think your people will will definitely catch that, don't you? I, I mean, I do. Ben. I hope yeah. so. I hope so. Well, we appreciate you sharing today with us. I've Thank enjoyed. You. It's been great. I've enjoyed. Thank you. Thank you, Scotty. <laughs>